Hello. Uh, today we will talk about tubular interstitial diseases. And the word disease is quite fitting here because uh, not, all the di not all the diseases included in this group are inflammatory. Uh, there are also some primary non-inflammatory conditions, so it's better to cover them with the term tubular interstitial diseases. So today in this lecture we will talk about uh, ATN, mean, meaning uh, acute tubular injury slash necrosis, and then we will move towards the uh, inflammatory conditions of tubules and interstitium of the kidney, which means tubular interstitial nephritis. So let's start with ATN. What does it mean? It's a clinical pathological condition which is characterized by acute kidney failure and morphological signs of tubular damage. So as you can see, uh, this definition is quite broad, quite unspecific. A few notes. Uh, first, morphological correlate, meaning uh, some changes that we can see under the microscope is not always present. So in case of uh, milder forms of uh, injury or in uh, early stages of injury, the morphological correlate doesn't necessarily need to be present and the disease can be functional only. And the morphological changes can develop later on. Also, the term necrosis is not exact because sometimes uh, we can see milder forms of cellular regression, cellular injury. Tubular damage doesn't necessarily need to be a necrosis. You can see you can see milder forms of regression in case of milder injury or in early stages of ATN. So the necessary uh, the necrosis doesn't necessarily need to be present. So that's why I called it uh, acute tubular injury slash necrosis. And why tubular? It's because the proximal tubular epithelia is the most sensitive part of the kidney. So the Changes are the most prevalent in proximal tubules. The etiology is quite broad. The most common is ischemia. So that's why we call it ischemic ATN. Any sort of ischemia uh, can lead to any sort of ischemia that affects the kidney can develop the, some level of ATN. It can be shock any form of shock, it can be malignant hypertension, vasculitis, thrombotic micro microangiopathy, and many others. That's why we call it sometimes a shock kidney. Or it can be a direct toxic insult to tubular epithelia. We call it nephrotoxic ATN. It can be myoglobin, hemoglobin, bilirubin, various drugs, toxins, etc. Speaking about the myoglobin, hemoglobin, bilirubin, uh, the injury of the kidney caused by these, let's say, substances, is has a more complex pathogenesis because uh, these these uh, substances have a tendency to create casts in the lumen of the tubules and collecting ducts, and the casts themselves. Uh, has a negative impact to the kidney and we will cover it later. So it's not only about the direct toxic insult to the epithelia, but it's also about the intrarenal obstruction. Uh, as I said, we will cover it in a minute. So what is the pathogenesis of ATN? First, we have some sort of injury to proximal tubular epithelia, ischemia, for example. So there is a damage of proximal tubular epithelia. In the, uh, in the early stages, uh, the change in the tubular epithelia is functional only. There is a loss of capability to reabsorb electrolytes, which leads to increased urine salinity. And increased urine salinity activates tubular glomerular feedback, and the kidney reacts to this feedback by, by vasoconstriction. And as you would probably guess, the vasoconstriction aggravates the ischemia. So there is another ischemic tubular damage and the circuit of that is activated. 
and later on the morphological changes in proximal tubular epithelia appear. You can see flattening and the subsequent detachment of the epithelia into the tubular lumen. So the cells slowly start to die out and they will detach to the lumen of the tubules. And in the lumen of the tubules and later on collecting ducts, you can see something we call granular casts. And granular casts, well, they are nothing else than a cluster of dead cells of the cellular debris. And uh, these casts blocks the flow of the urine. So we have intrarenal obstruction. And the intrarenal obstruction retrogradely blocks, in a retrograde fashion, blocks the filtration in glomeruli and it leads to the acute renal failure. So this is the pathogenesis of ATN. The clinical symptoms can be quite variable because uh, the symptomatology depends on the severity of the damage and on the previous state of the kidney. How damaged the kidney was before the initiation of ATN. You can see some various levels of decreased renal functions. And at the end of the spectrum is the fully developed acute renal failure with oliguria or anuria requiring dialysis. As the kidney starts to heal in, in the phase of regeneration, you can, you can appreciate a polyuric stage because uh, the tubular epithelium during the regeneration have a tendency to lose solutes and, and fluids. And so during the regeneration of ATN, the kidney often goes into the polyuric stage and those patients uh, loses a lot of huge amounts of the fluid via urine. How the kidney look li looks like? What is, the, what is the morphology? In macroscopy, there is an edema of the kidney. In macroscopic, there, the kidney is edematose. And the typical appearance is, is uh, like that. The cortex is typically pale. There is a paleness of the cortex. Sometimes it's just the paleness. It, it, paleness. Sometimes it's just the ischemia of the cortex in a, in a worse states let's say of atn you can see even necrosis of the of the cortex sometimes in very severe conditions in some very severe uh, examples of atn you can see even the diffuse necrosis of the cortex but in a lot of cases there is there is just paleness of the cortex and this pale contact cortex is in contrast with hyperemic medulla so there is a reactive hyperemia of the mucosa. And this is the typical appearance of, uh, of ATN, of, uh, we call it shock kidney. There is a pale cortex and hyperemic medulla and the whole kidney is swollen. Speaking about microscopy, I will switch to the image. As I said, there is a some sort of regression of the proximal tubular epithelia. Here you can see the flattening of the tubular cells. Here you can see that the cells have irregular shape, the cytoplasm is vacuolated. All those changes represent a certain, certain amount, a certain level of regression of the cell. And as time passes, those cells would start to detach into the lumen of the tubules and they would start to create granular casts. In the interstitium, there is usually some sort of edema. It is not so prevalent here on the picture, but usually there is a certain amount of edema and some inflammatory cells. But those inflammatory cells are usually not frequent, not, uh, not dense, because this uh, condition is primarily non-inflammatory and the inflammation is just a secondary reaction. So usually the inflammatory cells are not so prominent. And in the medulla, we would see some sort of hyperemia. It's good to keep, it's good to keep in mind one thing. Uh, 
certain degree of ATN accompanies almost all glomerulopathies. It's because there are no collaterals in kidney. And if you damage uh, glomeruli somehow, you will basically create ischemia of the rest of the kidney. So the certain degree, certain level of ATN accompanies almost all diseases which are primary, primary uh, glomerulopathic. So any glomerulopathy is usually followed by a certain level of ATN. And of course the severity of ATN depends on the severity of the primary glomerular disease. <clears throat> okay, so this was ATN. And now let's move to the inflammatory conditions of tubules and interstitium, which we call tubule interstitial nephritis. TIN, it's a disease, or better to say, it's a group of diseases, which are characterized by interstitial inflammation and tubular damage. <clears throat> the etiology is very broad. It can be infection. It's often acute bacterial infection, which we will cover in a minute. We will speak about acute bacterial pyelonephritis. It can be chronic pyelonephritis. And its uh, etiopathogenesis is more complex than in case of acute pyelonephritis. And it can be, of course, uh, other infection. It can be viruses uh, and something else. Various toxins and drugs can induce uh, tubular interstitial damage. It can be acute, it can be chronic. We could also include heavy metal poisoning. Certain metabolic diseases can induce tubular interstitial damage, such as urate nephropathy, nephrocalcinosis, and some others. We will talk. We will speak about them uh, as well. Mechanical factors can play a role here as well, especially the chronic urinary obstruction. Again, we will cover it in a minute. Neoplasias especially multiple myeloma. We will talk about myeloma kidney, but it doesn't necessarily need to be myeloma. It can be other neoplasia. And uh, tubular interstitial nephritis can appear as a part of various systemic autoimmune and immunopathological conditions. And we, we could include also rejection because the rejection of the transplanted kidney that's basically tubular interstitial nephritis well, chronic tubular interstitial nephritis and then we have we have a group of let's say others uh, we could include some vascular disease balkan nephropathy which i will cover again in, in, a, in a few seconds and some tins can be idiopathic as well Again, one important note. Tubular interstitial nephritis also may develop, may, may also develop as a consequence of primary glomerular disease. Uh, one of the mechanisms can be like this. If you have a primary glomerular disease that somehow damage and disrupts the glomerular basement membrane, the filtration membrane, it can lead to the influx of certain substances into the primary urine, which, which can be toxic to the tubular epithelia. So even the uh, primary glomerular disease can subsequently lead to TIN because it allows uh, bypassing of some certain substances from the blood to primary urine which can be toxic to the tubules and interstitium. So again and again, I mentioned it a uh, few, uh, I, I, would, I, I, think, I think I mentioned it uh, several times, then the individual compartments of the kidney usually are not isolated. So uh, TIN can develop as a consequence of primary glomerular disease. Primary glomerular diseases are usually accompanied uh, by uh, ATN, acute tubular necrosis, and so on. So all those compartments are interconnected. How does it look like? 
acute tubular interstitial nephritis has usually rapid onset and uh, there is a acute uh, let's say acute morphology of the inflammation usually the, usually there is a certain amount of interstitial edema there is inflammation the inflammation is acute so sometimes we can or in a lot of times we can see quite a lot of neutrophiles in the inflammation and there is also a tubular damage Chronic TIN is a chronic type of inflammation. It will mainly consist of mononuclear cells, meaning lymphocytes and plasmacytes, because they are typical for chronic inflammation. And there is usually a certain amount of interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. As you can see, these tubules are atrophic, they are small, with flattened epithelium. The clinical presentation, again, is variable. It depends on the type of tubular interstitial nephritis, uh, its severity and duration. We can appreciate some typical signs of tubular damage. These signs are typical for the damage of the tubular part of the kidney. Those patients usually uh, experience polyuria, nocturia, and uh, electrolyte uh, and metabolic disturbance. In a lot of cases, you can see hyponatremia and metabolic acidosis. Sometimes you can see more isolated defects of tubular functions, which we will cover at the end of the lecture. And usually, the, usually there is an absence of glomerular damage, such as nephritic syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, glomerular type of hematuria. But as I said, TIN can sometimes develop as a consequence of primary glomerular disease, so this is not 100% rule. And now let's talk about concrete uh, specific uh, examples of TIN. And we will start with acute pile nephritis. Uh, acute pile nephritis is inflammation affecting affecting tubules and interstitium, which is understandable because we are talking about tubule interstitial diseases. But it also includes kidney calyces and pelvis. That's why we call it pyonephritis. And with regards to the etiology, in uh, most of the cases, it's ascending bacterial infection. Usually it's ascending bacterial infection as a progression from the lower urinary tract infection. The hematogenic spread is quite rare. It can be a complication of infective endocarditis, for example, but usually it's ascending infection. The most common causative agents are E. coli, Klebsiella, and some others. So usually bacterial ascending infection from lower urinary tract infection. And basically anything that can predispose the patients to lower tract infection can also predispose patients to acute pile nephritis. Women generally. Women generally are more prone to pile nephritis. It's because their urethra is shorter and more straight. And it's more easier for the bacteria to climb up. Any sort of urinary tract obstruction, such as prostate hyperplasia, kidney stones, nephroidiasis, external comp compression by tumor, for example. So in, in other words, any stagnation of the urine can predispose patients to the inflammation. The same goes for urinary catheter, especially long term. Any immunodeficiency. And we can mention also diabetes mellitus because patients with diabetes mellitus have um, impaired phagocytosis, which can be basically regarded as a sort of immunodeficiency.
Patients with vesico-ureteral reflux. Patients who has a reflux of the urine from the bladder to the ureter are again more prone to the bacterial inflammation and various congenital malformations, which are usually associated with some level of obstruction or reflux. Patients with acute polynephritis usually experience high fevers. That's a good differentiation. Uh, that's a good uh, sign. How to differentiate uh, polynephritis from lower urinary tract infection? Because the patients with cystitis, for example, they usually have no no fever or no increased temperature or just a mildly mildly increased temperature, but they shouldn't have high fevers. High fevers are much more typical for pyelonephritis. Patients usually have a pain in the lower back and they are in a risk of sepsis. So acute pyelonephritis is a severe clinical condition. It's a severe disease because there is a risk of sepsis and a risk of irreversible damage of the kidney. And how does it look like? Again, I will skip, skip to the image. So there is a inflammation in the muco mucosa of the pelvis and calyces. That's why we call it pyelonephritis. And then the inflammation climbs into the interstitium of the kidney. Because I said that the pyelonephritis is usually acute bacterial infl infection, the inflammation will be typically purulent you will experience or you can see many neutrophiles which are situated in the interstitium and they also invade tubules. You can see it here. This is damaged and dilated tubule. There is the second one with damaged epithelium and the lumen is filled with pus. These are numerous uh, neutrophiles. As you can see, the inflammation has a conical shape. It looks like a cone. It's quite typical and it's because the, the inflammation has a tendency to follow nephrons. So that's why the inflammation has a typical conical shape in the interstitium. Later on, as the disease progresses, you can see also abscesses in the kidney parenchyme, smaller or bigger. And acute pyelonephritis has a lot of complications and severe complications. Sepsis. I mentioned it before. Patients are in a risk of sepsis. That's the first thing. Second thing. I said that uh, as time passes, a numerous small or large abscesses forms in the parenchyme of the kidney. And in really severe conditions, the whole kidney can be destroyed, the whole parenchyme of the kidney can be destroyed, and the rest of the kidney is just a sac filled with pus. And this is called pyonephros. The inflammation can progress to the fat around the kidney and create abscesses in the retroperitoneum, which we call perineal abscesses and since the since the inflammation climbs in the renal papillae sometimes you can see purulent necrosis of the renal papillae and such necrotic papillae can detach and they can create obstruction in the ureter that's why the papillary renal necrosis is dangerous. Speaking about the renal papillary necrosis in a more general way, uh, the pyelonephritis is not the only disease or condition that can lead to papillary necrosis. There is a lot of them. And if you want to remember them, you could use the acronym postcards. 
meaning pyonephritis, as we mentioned before, and then also obstruction of the urogenital tract, sickle cell disease, tuberculosis, liver cirrhosis, uh, usage of alcohol or analgetics, rejection of the kidney, diabetes mellitus, and systemic vasculitis. So as you can see, many conditions can be complicated by renal papillary necrosis. But let's get back to pyelonephritis. As time passes, the pyelonephritis starts to heal. And maybe you, maybe you remember from general pathology, if you have a purulent focus somewhere in the tissue. Uh, the purulent focus heals by influx of macrophages that starts to swallow the dead cells of the original parenchyme and they also swallow the neutrophils because the neutroph because neutrophils die out in the in the pus. They undergo regression. In a lot of cases they are steatotic and then they will die out. That's why a pus is yellow. And the macrophages starts to swallow everything. So they swallow a lot of uh, they swallow a lot of uh, fat from the neutrophils and they swallow also a lot of cytoplasmic membranes from the from the neutrophils and from the dead cells of the original tissue. And cytoplasmic membrane that's fat as well. So as the infla as the purulent focus heals, you can often see a clusters of macrophages with pale foamy cytoplasm because the cytoplasm is full of fat. It's basically a steatosis of the macrophages. And this collection of macrophages with foamy cytoplasm as a residuum of a resorbed purulent focus, it's called inflammatory or post-inflammatory pseudoxantoma. And the same things happen in kidney, in case of pyelonephritis. Since pyelonephritis is a purulent type of inflammation, in some cases, especially uh, in more severe cases, the acute pyelonephritis can be healed. And as a, as a remnant, as a residuum, you can appreciate multiple pseudoxantoms. This condition we call xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. And xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis is not dangerous by itself, but uh, it can very easily mimic clear cell carcinoma of the kidney, the most common carcinoma of the kidney. It can mimic such carcinoma on a gross level, on a microscopic level, and also on radiological level. So it's good to keep in mind that this condition exists because it has important differential diagnosis. And now let's move to chronic pyelonephritis. Chronic pyelonephritis has a much more complicated uh, etiopathogenesis than the acute one. It's the chronic inflammation and with uh, subsequent scarring and atrophy affecting tubules, interstitium, pelvis, and calices, which again is quite understandable given the given the definition. Uh, because there is a fibrosis and atrophy of the parenchyme, you can also see a damage and flattening of the renal calices. And this, uh, let's say, damage, this change in renal calices distinguishes chronic polynephritis from chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. Uh, there is exception and it's analgetic nephropathy, which involves calices as well, and we will talk about it uh, later. And of course, it's a chronic disease, chronic disease affecting uh, kidney, uh, so there is a risk of hypertension and subsequent uh, chronic uh, renal failure. How does it look like? It's a chronic disease. Uh, 
So there is a chronic type of inflammation, especially lymphocytes and plasma sites in the interstitium, in the interstitium of the kidney and in the mucosa of the calices and pelvis. There is usually some sort of interstitial fibrosis, especially on the gross level. You can see larger scars, which are depressed, and atrophy of the renal parenchyme. As I mentioned before, because of that, the kidney calices are flattened, which is quite a typical, task, typical sign. The tubules are atrophic, and sometimes the atrophy is uh, quite severe, as you can see here on the picture. Here you can see multiple tubules, which are small, with a flattened epithelium. They show tendency to cluster, to clump, and they contain a lot of hyaline casts in the lumen. And uh, as you can see, this may look like a thyroid gland. And that's why severe tubular atrophy is sometimes called thyroidization of the kidney. Because those atrophic tubules with the numerous hyaline uh, casts in the lumen may resemble thyroid gland. As I said, the etiopathogenesis of chronic polynephritis is much more complex compared to acute polynephritis. So I will start to I will try to clarify it. There are two subtypes of chronic polynephritis. The first and the more common one is a reflux nephropathy. The second and less common is chronic obstructive polynephritis. Reflux nephropathy means that you have some sort of damage of the kidney parenchyme caused by urinary reflux. So there is a reflux of the urine back to the interstitium of the kidney with subsequent damage. It's the most common cause and the reflux is usually congenital. There is a congenital vesicoureteral reflux, meaning that there is a reflux of the urine from the bladder to the ureter and then later on it can even reach the renal parenchyme. It can be acquired as well, but it is less common. And the kidney damage is a combination. It's a combination of recurrent infections and direct toxic effect of the urine. First, the reflux uh, is a risk factor for bacterial infection. So those patients usually experience recurrent bacterial infections. So there is a recurrent bacterial pyelonephritis. And also the reflux of the urine into the interstitium of the kidney has a direct toxic effect to the interstitium. We call it sterile, sterile reflux. So even without the bacterial infection, you can see some sort of damage and inflammation because of the reflux and toxic effect of the urine to the interstitium. So this is pathogenesis of reflux nephropathy. Uh, chronic obstructive pyelonephritis means that you can have any sort of obstruction of the urinary flow, as we discussed before. And the problem is that the obstruction itself, again, we mentioned it before, uh, it predisposes patient to recurrent infections. So also those patients uh, experience recurrent bacterial pyelonephritis. That's the first thing. And second thing, the stagnation of the urine presses on the renal parenchyme and there is a subsequent pressure atrophy of the renal parenchyme hydronephrosis so this is the etiopathogenesis of chronic obstructive polynephritis but as you would probably guess those two conditions reflux and obstruction can combine because the reflux of the urine, if it is severe enough, can create also a certain level, a certain amount of pressure atrophy. And vice versa, the stagnation of the urine in obstructive pyelonephritis can also lead to some level of influx of the urine to the interstitium. So some sort of, uh, let's say, sterile 
sterile inflammation in the interstitium can be seen also in chronic obstructive pyelonephritis. So those two conditions can, can be combined a little bit. And as you can see, the etiopathogenesis of chronic pyelonephritis generally is much more complex than in acute one. Okay, so let's leave acute pyelonephritis and chronic pyelonephritis and let's talk about uh, other tubular interstitial diseases. Toxic and drug induced. It is not so rare, it's quite common. A lot of drugs and toxins can induce tubular interstitial damage and often it is ordinary drug such as antibiotics, NSAID, analgetics, antidiuretics. It can be acute hypersensitivity reaction and various types of hypersensitivity reaction can play a role. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be just type 1. It can be chronic cumulative toxic damage and um, various toxins and drugs uh, as, as, as I mentioned before can induce also ATN acute tubular necrosis. So it doesn't necessarily need to be just tubular interstitial nephritis. Uh, usually, uh, oh, so, okay, so it was uh, toxin and drug induced TIN. And now let's talk about the acute, acute one, acute hypersensitivity. The acute drug induced uh, and toxin induced TIN uh, the onset is usually two weeks after the drug usage. In a lot of cases, it's a synthetic penicillin, such as meticillin. And the patients usually experience fever. In a lot of cases, there is a peripheral eosinophilia, rash, and then signs of renal damage. The histology is like this. It's acute. So there is a... a let's say, image of acute tubular interstitial nephritis with interstitial edema and some inflammatory cells. And the composition of the inflammation depends on the type of hypersensitivity. If it is type 1, especially, you can see a lot of eosinophils, as you can see here. But as I said, the eosinophils are not a rule because other types of hypersensitivity can be involved as well. Chronic drug-induced TIN is a cumulative damage, as I mentioned before. In a lot of cases, it's caused by paracetamol or phenacetin, which is analgetics. So sometimes we call it analgetic nephropathy. In morphology, you will see image of chronic tubular interstitial nephritis. So you will see chronic type of inflammation with subsequent fibrosis and tubular atrophy. But in case of analgetic nephropathy, as I mentioned before, analgetic nephropathy is also accompanied by damage of the calyces. And in histology, you can see something we call an analgetic microangiopathy. And it looks like a hyalinosis of the vessels in the mucosa of pelvis and calyces. So analgetic, analgetic nephropathy looks a little bit different from other TINs because there is also involvement of the renal calyces. And as I mentioned before as well, there is a risk of renal papillary necrosis. Herbal nephropathy. It's a tubular interstitial disease caused by usage of various healing herbs, usually in, in a form of tea. And uh, this group includes also Balkan nephropathy, because Balkan nephropathy is basically a herbal nephropathy uh, in Balkan region. It's endemic uh, herbal nephropathy. And the microscopy is unspecific. There is a general picture of chronic tubular interstitial nephritis with a chronic inflammation, interstitial fibrosis, some sort of tubular atrophy. Therefore, usually, uh, clinic. Uh, Clinical correlation is necessary here for the diagnosis.
and now let's move to multiple myeloma. Patients with multiple myeloma can experience kidney damage in a lot of cases. And the kidney damage is quite complex. It's, in a lot of cases, it's a mixture of uh, more types of damages. First, patients with multiple myeloma can develop systemic AL amyloidosis. And AL amyloidosis can affect a kidney as well. So that's, that's the first thing. Second thing, patients with uh, myeloma can have hypercalcemia. It's because myeloma uh, typically creates a multiple osteolytic lesions in the bones uh, with subsequent hypercalcemia. And hypercalcemia itself can damage a kidney, and we will talk about it later. And the third type of damage is a uh, damage of uh, tubules and interstitium, and that's why the um, myeloma kidney can be included into the group of tubular interstitial diseases as well. So the kidney damage is a uh, complex. Let's talk about uh, the amyloidosis. Uh, the AL amyloid usually deposits in uh, uh, in glomeruli. In a, you can see it in a mesangium and also in a subendothelial space. Also, you can appreciate it in a wall of arterioles and arteries. And later on, the more extensive and compact deposits will appear in the kidney. Tubular damage has a, this etiopathogenesis. So there is a monoclonal immunoglobulin that goes from the uh, from the blood to the urine, and it has a tendency to precipitate with tam horsfall protein, which is a normal physiological physiologic component uh, in the lumen of the tubules. And this monoclonal immunoglobulin precipitates with such a protein, and it creates myeloma casts in tubules. And as we mentioned before, if you have uh, casts in tubules, and it doesn't necessarily need to be myeloma cast, it will lead to intrarenal obstruction with subsequent acute kidney failure. And the acute kidney failure can be also aggravated by direct toxic effect of immunoglobulin to tubular epithelia. So there are basically two pathways which can lead to acute kidney failure. It looks like this. This is myeloma cast in the tubule. The myeloma cast has a typical, let's say, violet or violet to grayish color. And there is often a giant cell foreign body type reaction around the casts. And third was hypercalcemia. But the multiple myeloma is definitely not the only, only cause of hypercalcemia. There is a lot of causes of hypercalcemia, so the kid, uh, kidney in, can be uh, damaged in uh, patients with hypercalcemia for various reasons. So it's not about it's not just about multiple myeloma. It can be patient with uh, hyperparathyroidosis, patients uh, with bone destruction by other tumors. Uh, it can be patient with uh, milk alkali syndrome or vitamin D intoxication. And hypercalcemia itself can damage the kidney via two mechanisms. First is nephrocalcinosis. Nephrocalcinosis is uh, again a type of tubule interstitial damage, so that's why we can include the hypercalcemic kidney damage also in tubule interstitial diseases. And the second is increased risk of nephrolytiasis, kidney stones. So those patients can experience kidney stones with a lot of complications such as uh, urinary obstruction, for example, or bacterial infection. And nephrocalcinosis, it basically means deposition of the calcium in the interstitium of the kidney and in the tubular epithelia, again with subsequent chronic damage. So this was multiple myeloma and hypercalcemia.
myeloma kidney, nephro, uh, nephrocalcinosis. And then let's talk about uric acid nephropathy. It's a kidney damage in patients with hyperuricemia. As you probably know, uh, hyperuricemia is usually a consequence of patients with, uh, uh, let's say, chronic, chronic uh, increased consumption of uh, meat because there is a lot of cells and a lot of DNA in the meat and those patients will develop hyperuricemia in a chronic way with subsequent goat formation. But the hyperuricemia can be also acute and uh, it's typically, uh, those are typically the patients with uh, malignant tumors and especially with the hematologic malignancies. Those patients undergo chemotherapy and if you are not careful enough with the chemo especially in case of hematologic malignancies, you will develop a rapid breakdown of the neoplastic cells. And those dying neoplastic cells release a large amount of DNA, of nucleic acids, in a short, uh, short course of time. And this patient can develop quite rapid and severe acute hyperuricemia, which can have a lot of negative consequences as well. And speaking about uh, kidney, kidney in patients with hyperuricemia can be uh, damaged in acute way. We call it acute uric acid nephropathy. In chronic way, we call it chronic uric acid nephropathy. And also the hyperuricemia uh, increases the risk of kidney stones. So also those patients are in a risk of nephrolytiasis, just the different type of the stone. Let's talk about the acute nephropathy. Uh, it's caused by precipitation of uric acid crystals in the tubules and collecting ducts. So the consequence is, as we mentioned before, intrarenal obstruction and acute kidney failure. And as I, as I mentioned before, uh, this is especially true for the patients with hematologic malignancies undergoing chemotherapy because there is a rapid breakdown of the neoplastic cells and releasing of nucleic acids. Uh, chronic uric acid nephropathy that's basically gout it looks like a classic gout just in the kidney so you can see depositions of uh, uric acid crystals in the kidney interstitium and there is it's usually accompanied by chronic inflammation fibrosis and sometimes you can see even a foreign body reaction to the crystals so chronic uric acid nephropathy is basically gout in the kidney. And this is the, this is the last, uh, last type of tubular interstitial damage and it's chronic nephrosis or bile cast nephropathy. It's a kidney damage in patients with acute or chronic liver disease. It's basically a morphological correlate for hepatorenal syndrome. So the clinical, clinical correlate is hepatorenal syndrome, morphological correlate is cholemic nephrosis. Those patients with uh, liver disease usually have a hyperbilirubinemia and uh, these patients can develop bilirubin or pigmented casts in the tubules and collecting ducts. And again and again, the mechanism of the injury is the same as the myeloma, for example, or patients with um, myoglobin urea, for example. There is a intrarenal obstruction of the flow of the urine and subsequent acute kidney damage. So this is good to keep in mind that the cholemic nephrosis exists and it's basically a, a morphological correlate of hepatorenal syndrome. And morphologically, you would see pigmented casts with bilirubin in tubules and collecting ducts. Okay, and we are basically at the end. I included uh, last, let's say, two slides. Uh, in which I would like to cover tubulopathies. What it is? Tubulopathies, tubulopathy or tubulopathies, it's a group of diseases which are characterized by altered tubular transport. So basically those are diseases in which there is a, let's say, alteration of a specific uh, protein that ensures tubular transport of a specific solute, specific uh, substance. Uh, 
this group of diseases is quite marginal from the pathological point of the view because uh, these diseases are usually functional only without any important morphological correlate so from the pathological point of the view because pathology is morphological subject it's quite marginal but it's definitely not marginal from the clinical point of the view because tubulopathies are important and you should know them they can be congenital or acquired and they can be generalized or isolated generalized means that the transport of multiple substances is altered and isolated means there is a de defect of the transport of uh, one specific uh, solute, one specific substance. And this is the last slide. I included just a few examples. I think this is absolutely enough from the pathological point of the view. This is not enough from the clinical point of the view, but enough from the pathological point of the view. The example of generalized tubulopathy is so-called detoni debre fanconi syndrome, which is defined by glycosuria, phosphatiurea, amino acid urea, and increased urine excretion of bicarbonate. And isolated uh, examples of isolated defects, we can subclassify them according to uh, type of the substance that whose transport is altered. Example of impaired amino acid transport is a renal amino acid urea. Example of glucose impaired transport is a renal glucose urea. And the word renal is quite important here because, uh, as you probably know, uh, patients usually develop glucose urea because of diabetes, because diabetic patients have an increased level of glucose in the, in the blood and uh, the glucose goes into the urine and creates glucose urea. But this is renal glucose urea, which means that the primary, in primary defect is in kidneys. Example of uh, impaired transport of bicarbonate is a renal tubular acidosis. Example of phosphate uh, defect is so-called X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, or synonym is vitamin D resistant rickets, because this subtype of rickets doesn't react to vitamin D therapy. Impaired electrolyte uh, transport uh, can be seen in Barter syndrome, for example, which is defect of this uh, sodium potassium chloride uh, co-transporter. An example of impaired water transport can be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Again, the word nephrogenic is important because, as you probably know, you can have also a central diabetic insipidus uh, in which the primary, in, primary damage is in pituitary gland. And that's basically all, and I thank you for your attention, and see you next time.